about the month of Iyar and Rafua, healing. Why would we be learning about healing in the month of Iyar? So it's brought down in, in all of the Kabbalistic and Hasidic Sfarim that the three letters of the month of Iyar are, well, actually you spell it with two yuds, Aleph, Yud, Yud, Resh. But Aleph, Yud, Resh is, are the Roshi Tebot of Ani Hashem Rofecha. I am Hashem, your healer, your doctor. <laughs> and that's what Iyar is. So Iyar has traditionally been connected to the idea of Rafua. And we're going to investigate that tonight. These are based on teachings from Rob Ginsburg. And we'll start with that in the, in the Tanakh, in the Bible, so the month of Iyar is called the month of Ziv, Chodesh Ziv. Ziv means illumination. Why would the month of Iyar be called illumination? Is because after the shorter days of the winter, when you, once you get to ER, the days get uh, progressively longer and there's more and more sunlight. Because in Israel, the, we'll call it the dry season uh, is beginning. No, no more rain until next October, November. And the sun is shining all the time except for in the last two days there's been a sharab and very dusty with the sand from the Negev. But in general, it's very, very, uh, uh, the sun is shining. So ER also, the same letters of ER is Ya'er, like in Birchat Konim, Ya'er Hashem Elecha, that God should uh, shine his countenance. Excuse me. Yo'er Hashem panav elecha v'yichuneka. That God should illuminate through his face and give you grace. So illuminate. So we see that also ER is the same letters as to illuminate. And what does this have to do with, with, with healing? So that is what we're going to be looking into tonight. So the word in Hebrew for healing, for health, is refua. And Rav Ginswick explains that the root is the same root as the word rafa, which means soft or um, malleable something that's soft. Now, in the Torah, when it says, Ani Hashem Rofecha, I am Hashem, your healer, one might think that who gives the right for anyone else to heal? In other words, if we're in Hashem's hands, then if a person is not well, we could say, well, that's how it's supposed to be. Who are we to interfere? But the Torah doesn't hold this because uh, uh, in Parshat Mishpatim, so it says, Rafo Yirapeh, that when a person injures another person, he has to make sure that he gets the proper healing. And the Talmud explains that, that where it says, uh, Rafo Yirapeh, this gives a license to doctors to heal. So we see that there's a type of healing that comes from Hashem. And there's a type of healing that uh, people, doctors are allowed to administer. And in other words, they're God's agents to make people well. So Rav Ginsburg points out that when it says, Ani Hashem Rofecha, I am Hashem, your healer, you know, there's two ways to pronounce the letter pay, either pay or fe. And usually you'll see a dot. When it's called the hard sound, it's with a dot. 
And so Rob Ginsburg points out that when it, when it comes to Hashem's healing, it says, Ani Hashem rofecha, meaning in a sense, a soft type of healing. And the rapo yirape is with the hard sound of the pe. <clears throat> and that's, it, it's, it's in a sense, qualitatively different. Now, <clears throat> when the doctor understands that he's a shaliach, he's a, a, a messenger, that God has given him certain skills and certain abilities to learn how to heal and then to heal, then a doctor can combine both what we'll call human and godly types of, of healing. So since we're, we're, we're in the middle of Sphira to Omer, we want to connect this to what we're doing in Sphira to Omer. So first of all, the, the word for someone who is sick is chole. The person is chole. And the, the numerical value of chole equals 49. So it's pointed out that during the 49 days of the Omer, if you remember the Midrash that says that we fell to the 49th level of Tuma in Egypt, and we're trying to reach the 49th level of purity in order to be fitting vessels for the revelation at Sinai, which happens every year. It's, it's not just a one-time event, just like creation is not a one-time event. The creative process, God animating all of creation is a second by second uh, development. So the same thing with receiving the Torah and Shavuos. Every Shavuos we have a chance, each and every one of us, to receive the Torah again. And so the 49 days of counting the Omer we can use a lot of words, but we'll, one of the words we'll use is healing, rectification, refinement, fixing, improving. So we can put healing in also. Each and every one of us uh, needs a healing on, on many, many different levels, emotional levels, uh, intellectual levels, midot, our, our, our characteristics. We all need improving and healing. Now, this is a very, very, it's a simple Torah, but very, very beautiful <clears throat> that Rob Ginsburg explains that usually we translate the first sentence of the Torah, the first verse, Bereshit bara Elohim at the Shemaim Oretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Rob Ginsburg points out that the word create, bara, is the same root as the word for health, briut. Like when someone sneezes, we say, la briut. You should have good health. So you can uh, translate the first verse very differently. In the beginning, God began to heal the heavens and the earth. So we'd ask, what is there to heal? He just, he just created the heavens and the earth. What is there to heal? But we have the teaching from the Arizal and coming from the Zohar that we understand that before this world, there, was, there were other worlds. And the previous world was called Olamatohu, the, the world of chaos. And in that world, the <clears throat> vessels, the initial vessels of creation, shattered when they could not hold the light. We're going to see the importance of this in, in, in one minute with counting the Omer. So the shattered vessels of the previous world is what makes up this world. So when we translate the first verse of the Torah, in the beginning, God began to heal means that that's, in a sense, the mission of this whole world. 
And that's why the Arizal calls this world Olamatikun, the world of fixing. And so when we say um, healing or sickness, it's not necessarily just what we relate to as, as physical sickness. There is all kinds of emotional and psychological uh, problems that people, challenges, we'll call them challenges. I don't know anyone who's, who's not challenged with things that we need to fix. <clears throat> so if we take this idea of shvira takelim, so according to Kabbalah, why did the vessels shatter? So we're told that the light was too intense, too pure, too great for the initial vessels. But another reason is given is that we relate to the, the vessels that shattered as the spherot. And each of the spherot, in a sense, said, Ani amloch, I will rule. In other words, chesed says to all the other spherot, I, I, can, I can deal with everything on my own. I can handle all of the light. And Gavura says to all the other spherot, I'm, I'm Gavura. I can handle it. I don't need, in a sense, to interact. So how do we, how do we fix this? So this is exactly why we have this tradition that every night that we count the Omer, we combine two svirot. That is the fixing. And this also in, in our, our own personal lives, when, when we feel we can't reach out to anyone, we don't have to give to others. We're a world to ourselves. This is, makes a person ripe for a shattering of the vessels. And so the inter-inclusion of the Sfirot each night during the Omer period, this is the fixing. This is the fixing. So Rob Ginsburg goes farther that the, I'm going to point here, as you know, we're, <coughs> we're counting the seven lower Sfirot. The seven weeks of Sfirot to Omer are Chesed, Gevura, Teferet, Netzach, Hod, Yisod, and Malchut. And he explains that when you look at the right column, so sometimes these are called the, the six extremities, the vav kitzavot, and then they all flow into malchut. But the word kitzavot, extremities, can also mean extreme, or in Hebrew, kitzoni like too much on one side or too much on the other. And when the spherot are not inter-included, they tend to go to the extreme in either direction. So that's the importance of inter-inclusion in general. <coughs> and the whole seven week period of the Omer is a, a, a training, is a lesson in how we have to handle our own uh, emotions, that we have to learn to be more, we'll call it holistic. Now, this is very important because this sphera right here, this is teferit. Teferit is in the middle. As you can see, it's between the right and the left, but it's also between above and below. Teferit is right in the middle. And the root of the word refua, healing, is the same letters as the root of teferit, pa'er. It's just that the letters are permuted differently, but it's the same three letters that make the root of healing and teferit. So what can we learn from this? Something very, very important is, especially today, because we do have uh, all kinds of natural healing now. And, and until maybe 25 years ago, uh, normative uh, medicine didn't really recognize what we call natural 
healing. But that has changed radically in the last 25 years. And the idea is that it, it, you don't just treat the symptoms, you have to treat the whole person. And this, uh, I, I'm kind of saving for next week to go into this deeper. So to go back to this idea of the interinclusion. So the 49 days of counting the Omer, remember, it's the same numerical value of chole, of being sick. But the number 49 also is the gematria of what's called lev tov, a good heart. And if you remember in Pirkei Avot, uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai asked five of his students, what is the best way to walk in the world, to, to, re to relate to the world? And they gave their answers, and Elazar ben Arach said, Lev Tov, with a good heart. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said, I choose his answer more than the others because his includes all the others. So this is brought down in all the Hasidic Svarim is the ultimate goal of the 49 days of the Omer. So we always say it's Tikkun Amidot, it's fixing our, our characteristics. And the, the end result is simply to have a good heart. Or, or the way we say it, to be a mensch. To be a mensch. That's, that's what we want to get to. Because anything else is we're just kind of fooling ourselves and, and, and fooling others and, and maybe even trying to fool God. Ultimately, we have to have a good heart. So Rob Ginsburg explained, so what, how is a good heart connected to healing? So remember, we said that the word rafua, rafa, also means soft. So Rav Ginsburg says that having a soft heart is having a good heart, meaning the expression is to have a soft place in your heart for other people's um, troubles, that things touch us, that we're moved to help others. So this is this is this is a refua because I'm going to mention it now, but I, I hope to get into it more next week. Is that so much of modern ailments are coming from a unbalance in our lifestyles, and that depending on our the way we deal with things, they're finding now that this affects so many of the modern diseases that we have. And we all know is that if, if someone is not well, <clears throat> so if someone like gives up and, and loses their, their joy and their hope, there, it's it, it's actually it's been proven that this makes a huge difference in how a person uh, will be healed. So more of that <clears throat> um, next week. So we're going to continue with some of these same ideas. So it says in Pirkei Avot also that one should be like a reed that is is subtle and, and, and can move with the wind and not like a cedar tree which nothing can move it. It's uh, The cedar tree in, in the Middle East is like the redwoods in America. It's the, it's the largest tree, the, the, the tallest tree, the biggest tree, and it's a symbol of, of strength and uh, unmovability. So, I mean, we're not down on the Aries tree. We're not down in the cedar tree. But it says it's better to be like a reed 
that can adjust according to a situation and not like a, a cedar tree that, that nothing moves it. Nothing moves it to uh, compassion. So there is a concept, we already brought it up, that the previous world is called Olamatohu, the world of chaos. And this world is called Olamatikun, the world of rectification. And we're also told that this relates to our midot, to our emotions, to our innate characteristics, that each person has what's called a teva rishon, meaning a, a, an initial nature, that we're, we're born with a, a certain nature or propensity towards certain uh, attitudes, certain um, weaknesses. They don't have to manifest, but they, it's, it's, some of it is genetic. Some of it is chemical. And once we start growing, so these natural tendencies become tremendously influenced by what's called nature. That's what we're talking about. We're born with certain traits, but then nurture. In other words, on the surface, this is a whole other discussion because <laughs> it, it may not be 100% true, but let's just say on the surface, a person is born into a certain uh, country, a certain race. Their parents will be a certain religion They'll be in a certain culture and society. And until the person is in their teens or a young adult, they're to really totally um, formed by the peer pressure and all of these uh, nurture factors. So that's called Teva Rishon, our first nature. And then there's what's called Teva Sheni, our second nature. What is the second nature? That's what we do with the cards that were dealt. Again, whether it's nature or nurture, in a certain way, we're all dealt certain factors in our life, certain influences that in the beginning we have very little control over. And yet at a certain point, a person can make choices, can make decisions, can change even innate behavioristic tendencies can, can be changed. Is it easy? Absolutely not. It takes a lot of work. In fact, one of the Hasidic rabbis said, it's easier to learn the entire shas, meaning all of the ta Talmuds, than to change one innate quality. It's easier to learn the whole Gomorrah than to, to change, but people learn the whole Gomorrah and people are able to change also. Of course, it takes a lot of work. That is the work of Svera to Omer. Every day looking at the interinclusion of the Svirot and following up with what, what it's telling us. What are the what is the energy of the day? Okay, one second. Okay, so now we're going to go back. Remember, we started, why are we connecting healing with ER? Because the Roshi Tevot, the acronym of Ani Hashem Rofecha, Aleph Yud Resh is the month of Iyar. Now, when does God say that? So this is after we cross the Red Sea. And the Torah says, of course, we sang the song. We reach incredible heights. The Midrash says that everyone in Israel reached a level even greater than Ezekiel the prophet 
when he had the vision, what's called the Ma'ase Merkava, the vision of the chariot. Everyone experienced such a divine revelation. And then it says that we went three, we left Yam Suf, and we went three days without, without water, and the people cried out, what are we going to drink? Remember, this was just the, the, the initial days in the desert. They had brought very little provisions with them. They went in complete faith into the desert. There's no water. There's no water to drink. So it, the, the verse says, so they came upon a place of water, and it was later called Mara, from the word bitter. And it says they could not drink the water, ki marimhem, because they were bitter. So the usual translation is they couldn't drink the water because the water was bitter. But the Baal Shem Tov came and said, you, you could read the same words and just interpret it differently. Why couldn't they drink the water? Because the people were bitter. Why were they bitter? There's a number of different answers that are given. But the idea was that they had just come from this great miracle. And they, they collected all of the booty from the, the, the Egyptians that had uh, drowned. And now they're going into, into the desert and they kind of, listen, we just went through the 10 plagues, the, the exodus, the splitting of the sea. And in a sense, people expected this to continue forever on a daily level. And they went three days and what are we gonna drink? So they became bitter. Kimarim hem, they were bitter. So, so God says to Moshe, take a tree, it doesn't say a branch of a tree, it says a tree, and throw it in the water, and it will sweeten the waters. And Moshe did that, and then they could drink. And then God came and said, if you follow my ways and you listen to my instructions and my commandments, then all of the diseases that, you, that were present in Egypt, you, you, will, you will be free of them because I am Hashem, your healer. Ani Hashem Rofecha. That's the context of what God is, is telling them. So here we have, uh, this, is, this is the textual source. We're told that anytime water is mentioned in, in the Torah, it's a hint to Torah itself. So they learn, what does it mean they went three days without water? So it's interpreted not necessarily physical water, e e even though that was the reality, but because they were still um, so enamored with the miracle and with all of the booty that they had taken, they, they were not learning. And based on this, they went three days without learning. So based on this, uh, it was established that we should read the, we should never let more than three days go by without reading the Torah publicly. That's where the tradition comes from. That's why we read it on Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat. So never more than three days goes by without learning Torah. So some say, what is the tree that Moshe threw in the water? So we're told this symbolizes the tree of life. And the, and the Torah is compared to the tree of life. Every time we put the Torah back into the uh, Aaron Kodesh, into the Ark, we say 
that the Torah, um, Eitz Chaim He, it is a tree of life for all those that grab onto it. And so this is a very, very deep learning because it has to, it has to do with just our outlook on life and also with being healthy, both physically and mentally and emotionally is the, the Torah is what sweetened the bitter waters. What, what, is, what is the greatest bitter waters in the world, in a sense? It's having no purpose of thinking everything is just what we call stam. That I, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't really know who I am. I don't really know why I go to work every day. I don't know where all of this is going. That kind of, that kind of attitude leads to uh, pessimism, bitterness, and many, many, many very destructive uh, lifestyle choices. So the tree of life as the Torah is what gives us purpose. The Torah gives us not just purpose, but helps us answer the deepest existential questions that we have. Now, obviously, not everyone's every question is answered or can be answered, but Torah gives us purpose. It gives us a direction. It gives us a, a moral and ethical and spiritual compass in order to uh, journey through the 40 years in the desert. The 40 years in the desert represents our lifespan. That is, the symbolism is we all go through the desert, but what keeps us alive, what keeps us going as individuals and as a people is our attachment to to Hashem through the Torah. So that's why in a sense, the greatest healing is to, is to have purpose. Now, if you can imagine, and it's, it's not a nice uh, scenario, but let's say, God forbid, two people are uh, diagnosed with cancer. And one of them falls into great depression, into, into hopelessness, despair. And the other person also has to deal with quite a bit here, but they're able to have an attitude Whatever time I have left, I want to use it well. I want to I want to fix everything with my family, with my friends. I want to make the best of this time. I'm sure all of us at one time or another have either heard or read an article about uh, someone who um, is basically dying from cancer and says, this last six months has been the last, the best six months of my life. So two people, but it have different attitudes. And in, in most cases, the one who has a positive attitude, maybe they won't be healed, but uh, in many cases they will live longer and sometimes much longer. And even if they don't, the quality of their life will, will be radically different than someone who falls into deep despair and just wallows in, in their, in their um, what they consider their bad fortune. We should never be tested like this. We should never be tested. So, So Rob Ginsburg brings one other idea, and then we'll, <clears throat> we'll wrap this up. And as always, we'll open it up to 
questions and uh, comments. And that is, it says in the Gemara, is great is tshuva because it brings refuah. Great is repentance, return to Hashem, return to our core being, our core values, our root soul, and it brings a refuah. And again, this I, I'm hoping to pursue more next week. The, the importance of one's frame of mind in, in, in physical and emotional and mental health. So, Rob Ginsburg brings one last idea as to what, what is the root, what is the root of, in a sense, the opposite of Rafua? What what um, prevents Rafua? And he explains it's it's a egocentric worldview. And here we're not just talking, we all have egos, and we all live within our head 24-7. But there are certain people that the only thing that counts is themselves. Nothing else really matters. Anything else that gets in the way, <clears throat> um, not interested. And unfortunately, in the world, the way the world is set up, and the, the incredible competition that happens in the workplace and in the professions and in different businesses, and uh, it can be in schools, it could be in synagogues. It's, there's a lot of competitiveness which uh, feeds uh, taking care of yourself. So Rob Ginswick explains that this is one of the greatest impediments to living a, a healthy kind of mental, physical, and emotional kind of life. Again, we all have egos. God gave us a, an individual spark to pursue and, and a potential and a mission. That All of that is, is, is natural. But we all know in our own lives and people around us, the difference between giving people, well-adjusted people, and people who will ha have no problem to, to, to run you over if you get in their way. <clears throat> so Svirata Omer is a time that we should all be checking ourselves. We are all very far from perfect. We all have so many things that we can do better. But this is a time to really look honestly at these things. And every day, just a little bit of improvement. The truth is, once we get to Shavuos and Har Sinai, this process doesn't really end. It's just a 49-day training, but the idea of refining ourselves and improving ourselves and fixing ourselves. This is this is a daily exercise from day one to the end to the, to the end. This is this is the, the challenge, the opportunity of being in this world. So I want to bless all of us to use this time well, especially after this year. We all the whole world needs a, a great refua a tremendous, tremendous refua, and we should merit, we should merit to receive the Torah on, on Sinai again, and we should see the Torah as a, a, a tree of life and a tree of healing. <clears throat>